lot of people can use a zoom background that's like fake they can put the ocean in the back or whatever but this is real like um every one of these things i have props and books like do you see that where there's the blitz metric sign back there like choose you guys choose a color Khalid, samantha shared and what choose a color you like let, let me know in the chat or speak it red red <laughs> Red, 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 and red. Isn't that neat? Very cool. See this? So this is called a puck light, and you can get them for $30. And then this is a TV. You can buy this for like $250 at Walmart or whatever, right? And there's an Apple TV. Can you see this right here? There's an Apple TV. So I can... You see, like, this is my iPhone. And... I could connect to the iPhone. You see that there? Now I can surf on Facebook or Instagram or what have you. Like I, I could pull up Jeremy here on Facebook and or stories. Actually, this is a, you see this? I, I posted this yesterday. Should, should I eat ice cream? Yes or no? Or yes and yes, actually. I can turn this around. See that? All those cool things that you can do or here i'll show you behind the scenes check this out so uh, look at this see the back of my head see my bald spot mm -hmm. there's a little video studio here what do you think so that is the high end of where you can go with public speaking the low so end is, is the... my the low end is my office the high end is dennis's studio this, this one costs a little bit more, <laughs> but I can explain to you, like I knew nothing about this stuff a month ago, but you ever go crazy on Amazon? Like you see some stuff on Amazon, you're like, you buy that. And then it recommends, it's like, you should buy this too. You're like, okay, I'll buy that too. Right. And then pretty soon you've like bought all this stuff. Does that ever, has that ever happened to you? Yeah. You guys are shy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so Dennis, so I, I before we. Before we move along, I was starting to talk about keywords in public speaking. Yes. And my keyword is passion. And what I sense from you is a real passion about marketing and what you do. Could you yeah. talk a little bit about how important passion is when you are making a presentation to a client or a potential client? Passion, Jeremy, is absolutely key. I'm not going to do it from the back of my head. Let me do it from where you can actually see me <laughs> talk about passion from the back of my head. Look, the client doesn't know whether you actually know what you're talking about. And it could be you, the, a customer, where you're getting on a plane, you assume that pilot knows, knows what they're doing. Or you talk to a, a chiropractor. And if they're friendly and they're passionate, you assume that they're competent too, but you don't really know, do you? So passion is the only thing that they can really glom onto besides things like references and testimonials and like reviews. But most people don't actually do that kind of research. They go based on the passion because most people decide emotionally and the way we close deals, we like to demonstrate, for example, that we have expertise. So all the things we do in digital marketing, for example, we have checklists on how we do it. That way, it's not a matter of guesswork or just being believable. But at the same time, the thing that actually causes clients to buy from you is because they feel that you really care. So just an hour ago, I closed a $20,000 deal from someone I've never talked to before, never met. He sent me a text message saying, hey, I talked to my buddy Tommy Mello, and he's the real deal. And he says that you helped him can you help me do the same thing? And I said, why, sure. We got on the phone. 10 minutes later, $20,000. That was just an hour ago, right? And it was all about passion. This guy is a home service professional. He installs garage doors, right? He's got a $30 million business doing garage doors. Do you think he understands all the detail of doing like remarketing or building websites or doing Facebook ads? It was all about passion. And when you can put passion into any kind of public speaking that you have, like Jeremy said, like a LinkedIn video, or you go live on Facebook. Like those are all public speaking opportunities, aren't they? 
Like when you make a post on Twitter or Snapchat, isn't that public speaking? You're not on a stage. Well, you're theoretically on a stage called social media, whatever you want to call it, right? The world's largest stage. But passion is when you show that you really care about something. And it is not just raising your volume. A lot of people think passion is just talk louder or fake it till you make it or try to pretend that you really care about something. But I think passion is when, when you actually have a lot of knowledge because we, you know, I'll change this to something more interesting. I believe that competence creates confidence. So when you know something, you have passion about it. And to know something is to love something and to love something is to know something. And that just shows through. How's I think, that? yeah, I think that communication research also backs up everything you're saying, Dennis, because we talk in the research about source credibility, who's, who's the speaker, and message credibility. Is it a believable message? And I think yeah. those are the underpinnings of what you're talking about. So yeah. talk about how you cultivated the passion for what you do in marketing to be able then to express it to others. I've always focused on where I can make the biggest impact. And as cheesy as that sounds, 30 years ago, actually more than that now, because I'm, I'm 45. Can you believe this? I feel like I'm 18, but I'm actually 45. I don't know what happened to the last 20 years. But I was a tutor. And I did it because I made more money doing that than driving pizzas. I, did, I was a pizza hut delivery driver, right? And I didn't know any better back then. Sometimes you just, like, you don't know what you want to do. So you just end up doing random jobs, right? I see Khaled, he's, he's nodding, right? So you know that's true, right? And I just stumbled upon teaching in different ways because I didn't, I didn't set out, I wasn't like, like, you know, oh, Jeremy, I set out, I'm going to be a college professor. That's what I'm going to do. Not the, there's nothing wrong with that. But I never set out to be that. But I just found that where I seemed to do well and where I seemed to enjoy things was like it would be the day before um, a calculus exam. And students would come to me and I would help them stay up the night before because you know what they do. They don't study. They wait till the night before to study, right? So then I would help them not get an A, but I help them pass instead of fail calculus. And I really enjoyed kind of that rush of like, you know, like in those movies where you're like 30 seconds and the bomb is like clicking down and you, like you have to like cut the right wires and at the very last second, they're able to prevent the bomb from exploding. Like I felt like that. I really enjoyed doing that not just rescuing people in emergency impossible situations, but I worked at the learning enhancement center at Southern Methodist university when I was an undergrad and I enjoyed teaching the football players and the soccer players. I was a cross country athlete. I ran D one cross country in track and field. So I was around a lot of athletes and I enjoyed teaching small businesses. I built websites 30 years ago for local businesses. Like there was beyond conception, which is a baby, a high-end baby store, like baby products. We did it for Cartier, which is a high-end French jewelry place. We built the intranet for Raytheon, which is a defense contractor, which nowadays, I mean, these are billion dollar companies, right? But back then there was no internet. So I spent more time basically just teaching adults 30 years ago about what websites were in the same way that folks your age can teach people my age about social media. And there's such an opportunity there. And I found that through teaching, like if you know something, like for example, my friend Luria Petrucci, she's an expert at live streaming. So she was showing me how you set up a stream deck, which is really cool, right? I'm like, wow, what's this cool thing? I'm going to order it on Amazon. <clears throat> or, hey, did you know that you can upgrade your microphone and you could run it through a preamp like a Zoom H6? Like, what does this thing work? Yeah, what does this do? It's got XLR inputs. What the heck is that? Instead of 3.5 millimeter audio jacks right? And so when you just learn stuff and there's things that, that you, you don't, you just take for granted that you just know, like, like Sheridan, I bet you that if I were to look inside your head, if I were to like open up your skull and scan it, I would find all these cool things that you know about that you could teach other people, but you probably think, ah, that's like not a big deal. Everyone knows this or this or that. Right. But then that's, that's not true. And, and so I just found that through teaching, it was the easiest way for me to make an impact. And then I found that I could teach other people how to do that. And so now we've been able to help several thousand people start their own digital marketing agencies because they start with an area they know, like 
Italian restaurants. And my friend Ben, for example, have, have you ever been to like a bounce house, like a, a sky zone? You know what those things are? The trampoline parks? You guys don't go to trampoline parks, huh? Or no, you know what they are? Sheridan, you know what they are. You're smiling. Yes? Give me a yeah. yes. Okay. So Ben liked to hang out at trampoline parks. And I'm too fat now because I can't do like flips and stuff like that anymore. But you know how people do stuff like that. And he went, he was a, he was a manager there. So he's making like 12 bucks an hour at a trampoline park because he didn't know what he wanted to do, right? He's like 22 years old, right? Nothing wrong with that, right? And then he said, hey, um, you know, I was looking up like trampoline parks on Google and I was trying to find you on Google and your information's like all messed up and your website's all messed up. And I could just fix that for you. What do you say? And of course, the manager of the Sky Zone, some older guy, and I don't mean to stereotype like Jeremy and I are like, oh, back in my day, we used to whatever, walk uphill both ways. And so he fixed their website. He started running ads on Facebook. He started doing the different things because he joined our program. And so we started teaching him how to do digital marketing. Like um, a kid would have a birthday party. You know, and mom would like invite all these kids over and they'd have like two large cheese pizzas and then they would do the trampoline thing for two hours and they were so happy. So then he would have them leave a review on Yelp and on Google and then collect a little video and then put the video on the website. And lo and behold, what do you think happened after that? Come on, no wrong answer. What do you guys say? Come on, there's only four of us here. Five Can of us. Millionaire or what? <laughs> So he put those reviews up and then he started to get more. So call it, he started to get more customers for that local trampoline bounce park. I mean, it's like a Chuck E. Cheese, basically, if you've never been to one of those things. Right. And then he was so successful doing that, that, that the, the guy who owned that particular location, he told his other, like it's a franchise, like it's a chain, right? There's a bunch of these things all over. So now he has 30 of these trampoline parks as clients. And he's making $40,000 a month, which is a lot more than he was making as a manager at 12 bucks an hour. Isn't that cool? And the way he did it to Jeremy's question is that he just learned how to do something. And then he taught other business owners how to do something that he thought was really obvious. Like you guys know how to leave a review on Yelp. You guys know how to do like a Instagram story. Like do you able to make a video, like a 15 second video? You guys know how to do that? Guess how many businesses know how to do that? What percent of businesses know how to do that? Very little, right? And then just teaching other businesses how to do something that you think is obvious, whatever's like obvious inside Sheridan said, right? And that's all it is. That's teaching. So I got into teaching accidentally. And now after doing this for 30 years, I've made it my mission to teach the things that I know and help other people be able to share their knowledge, but not just teach for the heck of it, but teach so they can make money and make a living helping other people doing digital marketing. I think this is great, Dennis. The students have four major speeches in this class. They have to demonstrate a process and then give an informative speech and two persuasive speeches, a short and long one. And so these topics that you're talking about may be very good uh, inspiration. We were talking about inspiration earlier yeah. before you logged in to give them ideas about what topics they might select. Yeah, oh, it's easy. You could take any topic. Have you ever done Toastmasters? There's a section within Toastmasters called Table Topics, and you choose the topic of the day. And so you have to talk on green pencils, right? And you just have to talk for a minute on green pencils. And it teaches your mind the ability to think on the fly which is called extemporaneous speaking. So when you can do that, think about how much power you have in any situation, whether it's to close a deal, whether it's to negotiate with your parents about moving out, whether it's a new employer, whether it's like with your kids or whether it's like anything, every situation is a negotiation. Every public speaking is a negotiation on just a larger scale with just more people. And when you can learn to, like Jeremy said, to convince, to persuade, to inspire, we do all of them at the same time. Like you tell a story, right? With, with a story, you can, like I've told you several stories, right? Notice I, di I didn't just say, if you do digital marketing, you can make a career. I told you, I, I zeroed in on one particular story. I zeroed in on one, like my particular situation in a particular moment in time. 
Pixar, Disney, they focus in on a particular story, right? A moment in time. So you inspire that leads you to persuasion that leads you to negotiation or closing a deal or asking for money, right? So it's all public speaking. It's all like right now, all five of us here, we're engaging. Well, I'm doing most of the speaking. I want you guys to talk. But public speaking is whenever you're talking to anybody, not just when there's a microphone, right? I want to give students a chance to ask questions. I have one more that I want to ask you. We recently had an assignment about ethics, speaking about negotiation. And yeah. I know you've been doing a lot of thinking during this COVID pandemic about challenges your business and other businesses are facing. How do you approach ethics and communication uh, when you're dealing with clients and potential clients and others that other people that you work with colleagues etc one of my favorite speakers on this topic his name is chris voss and he actually teaches a master class if you've seen masterclass.com but you can if you don't want to pay you can go to youtube and watch all of these items and he's a hostage negotiator he led the fbi hostage negotiation team and he talks about the ethics in crisis which is very apropos to what we're doing right now would you agree and the point behind that is that if the other side doesn't trust you, then all bets are off and all communication breaks. And guess what happens when all communication breaks? Then you have more miscommunication because of lack of communication and you have the inability to do a deal. And in the vacuum that occurs when there's not good communication, you have rumors and gossip and all kinds of things because your brain wants to fill in that gap when it doesn't know what's going on. So that's why good communication is so important. And it starts with trust and trust comes from ethics. So you have to- And listening too, right? Active listening is part of showing that, that you have empathy. Empathy and trust are the same thing. So when you explicitly tell the other person that you're talking to, that when you say, I aim to be fair, and if at any point you believe that I'm not being fair with me, you let me know, okay? So that, that's what people will literally say. And when you practice active listening, you guys know the difference between- like hearing and listening or active listening versus just saying, yes. Someone says, blah, 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 blah. Do you understand? You say yes versus active listening. What's the difference? So hearing is just like, we're hearing everything around us all the time, but listening is like paying attention for each word the person's saying and put this like words inside your mind and yep. make a decision if you want like to continue listening or not even, you know? That's right, Colin. So how might you do that to communicate to the other person that you understand? What, what kinds of things might you say or do? I would be like, given my opinion about the speech that they're doing, you know, and given my ideas and my point of view, like what they're doing and what, or what they're saying. Yeah. It's like paying attention for others. Yeah. And then you could take it a step further on top of that. So you could say, Based on what you said, here's, here's some feedback I have, or here's my idea. But you could also say, so Khaled, what I hear you saying is this, this, and this. Does that sound right? So I'm reflecting it back to you. I'm not just saying, yes, I understand. Just like, you know, when, when mom gets mad and she says, blah, 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 don't be mean to Johnny or whatever you did that was wrong. Okay, yeah, mom, I understand. Or yeah, I'm sorry, and you're not really sorry, you know? So, when, so active listening is when someone says something, and then because everyone wants to feel like they're heard. When you show empathy, which is ethics, ethics and empathy and listening are synonymous. Would you guys agree? So when you do that and when someone says something and you're listening and then you reflect that back to them saying, Samantha, what I hear you saying, just let me know if I got this right, Samantha. What I hear you're saying is this and this, is that right? And that gives Samantha a chance to say, yes, it is. And then that confirms to you, like, yes, the message, the message she sent was relayed to me and it was good. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's easy to have miscommunication, right? Because we misunderstand a word or we didn't, like, get this one part of what they said. And then that gives you a chance to clarify it before it becomes something bigger. Because then it, we just assume that everything, like, we agreed on the one thing, but we actually didn't agree. That snowballs into a bigger problem later. And then, especially in business, it becomes a big deal and then people get mad and just then they blame each other and then you have politics and that kind of thing. Right. 
Well, let's see how well our other students have been listening and see what questions or comments you have. Sheridan, how about you? You're on mute. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like that's a, such a good um, technique to master, especially because for me, I work in a restaurant business right now and learning how to speak with customers the correct way. Um, it says a lot and like showing that you understand what they said and then giving your side to it, it makes them feel like, like their point is understood. So that is so key. Yes. Did you guys just hear what Sheridan said. That was so right on. She, so let me reflect that back to you, Sheridan. You tell me if this, if this, if I'm paraphrasing what you're saying in my words. When you're in a restaurant business, any kind of service business, you always have service failures, failures where someone's like mad about something, right? And if you can demonstrate first that you heard what they said and you empathize and you understand the issue, even if you give them news that they don't like, like you're not going to give them a refund or you know, you're not going to fire that server or whatever it might be. But if you first demonstrate, you understand because they, they just want to be heard and you show them some respect instead of like straight up arguing with them. Like people will argue on Yelp, which is obviously a huge mistake because you never win when you argue with them on Yelp, right? Because, you know, because they'll pull out the Yelp thing, right? It, you know, in restaurants, it's like a hostage thing. Like they throw the, the Yelp bomb at you, right? But to your point, right, you're saying if you, if you listen first and then you propose the solution, like I'll give you a free dessert. Oh, I'm sorry. You've been waiting for 20 minutes for this thing. We've been, you know, really busy. I know that you guys have been sitting here and hungry and, you know, we've been, you've been waiting a long time. Like when you show them that, they actually, they, they usually end up being very reasonable, right? That resolves the issue most of the time versus like, I need to see a manager. I'm going to tell everybody about how I hate you and I'm going to leave bad reviews everywhere, right? And what's so cool in a restaurant, Sheridan, is when a server comes to the table, listens to what people are wanting, but then it gets so excited about, about say, a special dish that, that they want to describe to us and convince us that, that we, we, we should try it, right? Yeah, well, like, I just want to say that. Um, when you um, kind of show that you agree with people, or not necessarily, like, agree that you understand their side, That's right. um, it helps them have a chance to change their mind. Because mm -hmm. you're going to say, like, I understand what you're saying about this. You, you feel this way about it. And then if you show your side, it helps them instead of automatically like sticking to their point and kind of like staying in the same mindset, they have an open mind and they're able to see that you understand, but you're also feeling this. And that's that is so key. Wow. You, so Sheridan, you have a natural skill with negotiation and public speaking. Do you know that? <laughs> have other people told you that? I've been told I'm good at arguing. But well, the best arguer is the one who wins without it even, without people even realizing it was an argument, right? Because you're smooth about it. what you just said there, which is give people a chance or, or show people that you understand, which is not necessarily agreeing with them. You're not just agreeing that that server was, was bad, but you're showing you understand it from their point of view. Then it's often easy to get them to see it from your point of view because it's really just their ego. If you can take the ego down, then it's easy to be able to talk, right? Call it knows where he's agreeing with that. So I think that's a key point in public speaking and negotiating is to demonstrate empathy, which is you understand. And like you said, Sheridan, it's not saying, oh yeah, I understand. Or the worst is, I'm sorry you feel that way. Right? That's not empathy, right? That's just being a jerk, right? But, when, but instead of saying, I understand, what could you say? Like, Samantha, what could you say instead of like, I understand? Could say like, I see where you're coming from, or I, I, I know why you take that stance, or something that lets them know that you're not just against them and dismissing everything that they're saying, but that you're actually processing what they're saying, and that you can see it from their side. How about this? You want to role play with me? Oh boy! <laughs> want to give it a shot? There's no risk. <laughs> It's not a hostage situation. Sure. 
Okay, so I'm at Samantha's restaurant. What kind of food do you serve, Samantha? You mentioned Italian earlier, so Italian, we'll go with okay. that. So Samantha's Italian restaurant. Great restaurant, been there a long time. Great reputation. You have a great chef, all this. And I come in and I think I'm a big deal, right? I'm important. And I've been waiting now 30 minutes for my food. I ordered appetizers, I ordered the lobster ravioli, and I'm hungry, and I want to see the manager. And let's say Sheridan is the server or whatever, and you're the owner, and I, I demand to see Samantha of Samantha's Italian Restaurant, and then Samantha comes over to my table. She's busy doing all this other stuff, but Sheridan says, hey, you need to go see that, that guy over there. He's like really mad and has demanded to talk to you, okay? Now <laughs> you and I are talking, and I'll say, Samantha, what the heck is going on here? I've been waiting 30 minutes for my food. Well, I'm very sorry, but we've got other customers and I guarantee my people are working hard to do everything that needs to be done. You guys are ridiculous. Do you realize that I'm gonna be late for my next meeting because I've been waiting for you? This is not I'm how you treat customers. Really sorry for the inconvenience. Um, I've not eaten all day. I've been in business meetings all day and I come here, you know, cause this, this has been my favorite restaurant for a long time. And I'm just sitting here hungry and starving and no one's even come to say hi. And now you're just telling me, well, sorry, you're busy. Well, I assure you that we're working hard to get your food out to you. This wasn't our intention to make you wait. We're pretty busy tonight. I assure you that we will get your food out to you as soon as we possibly can. Okay. So what do you guys think? I don't work in the that's service tough, tough industries, industry, so I don't have experience with that. It's nothing to do with restaurants, right, Jeremy? This, this is true in any situation. I'm just using food. As, like, you could use whatever. It could be a customer that's mad about something, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter what they're mad about. So the first step Ooh. is active listening where we want to reflect back to them so that they feel like they're understood. So call it, what would, what would you say to reflect back to an angry customer in this case? in this situation? I would come down, I don't know, like I would say, okay, I'm, I'm with you, like I'm continuing with you and I would do like anything that you want, like to make you happy or whatever, you know? Well, you can't do anything because the, the kitchen's already really busy, right? So you can't say your food will be ready in five minutes because like, that would be lying, anything, right? Like appetizers or something like that, drink, you know? Or I would so you don't, even, you don't even have to give like, a concession yet. Because oh, remember, like a discount from the restaurant. <laughs> no, no, you don't even have to do that. No, no, before you do that. So the, the first thing we talked about is active listening. So if we can just yeah. show that we understand, yes. then, sure. then, then we don't even, then we don't even have to give anything away, right? So what if we said, my, oh, sir, I'm sorry. I know you've been waiting all day. I, I can't imagine what it's like to, to not have eaten all day. And you're waiting here and it's been 30 minutes and you haven't gotten your food. Your, I'm sure your stomach is grumbling. I feel terrible about that. Now I've just demonstrated, I, I didn't give anything away. I didn't give them a discount. I didn't give them a free dessert. I'm just showing I, under, I understand. I didn't just say I understand, right? I'm saying we take care of a lot of important business people and I wish we were better. I wish we would have, wouldn't, would have gotten your food faster. I feel awful because I know you've been a frequent customer and this is not how we like to treat our customers. I feel terrible because I know you're hungry and it just makes us look bad that you're having to wait so long, right? Well, like, Jeremy, why is that so important to show that empathy before you give a concession? Well, I think you have to diffuse the tension. I, I was director of the School of Communication for 10 years before I went back to teaching full time. And I dealt with students who were upset about professors and professors who were upset about other professors and parents who were upset. And you had to listen and reflect back that, yeah, this is a problem that I want to I want to address. Yeah, but because you did otherwise, as you said, it's like a Yelp review. It just escalates. Yeah, and the minute it becomes an ego thing. Have you ever seen like two people, they initially get mad over a nothing and then that it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then it's like this huge, it turns into this huge thing even though it started from a nothing. You see it all the time, right? And it's not just kids, like people of any age you see this happen to. But like Jeremy said, if you can diffuse it before it gets there, 
then you're a winning negotiator. Like Sharon. And I, and I think Sheridan you're right. Be, I, I have found in my experience that if you take the time to truly listen, empathize, understand, put yourself in their shoes and understand what they're going through, that people become pretty reasonable pretty quickly yeah. as opposed to yeah. going flying off the handle. Exactly. And they get reasonable because you, you merely just show them respect. And it's one thing, it has nothing to do with restaurants. It's merely showing them that you care and you are looking at it from their point of view first. It doesn't mean you're giving any concessions. It doesn't mean you're doing a discount. It doesn't mean you're admitting that you're bad. It doesn't, it's nothing like that. You're just trying to say, let me, let me try to see it from your point of view. Right. And it's, it's authentic respect. I yeah. really respect you as another human being and yeah. we need to talk this through. Yeah. If you do that, think about how much pain you can solve. And I think that public speaking is doing that on a larger scale, showing empathy. There's a People famous, really resonate with that. There's a famous study that you're reminding me of, Dennis. The University of Iowa back in the 1990s at the law school was trying to understand why people sued news media for libel. And what they found out in most of these cases was that, say, a local TV station broadcast a story about somebody at 10 o'clock on the 10 o'clock news and it made them angry or the newspaper published something that people thought wasn't fair, they, the first thing they would do is what? What do people think would happen? I'm going to sue you. Yeah. But, but, how, but what's the first thing you do? What? When you're upset about the story, what would you do? You call the newspaper. You, you, you get on the phone and it's 1030 right. at night and who answers the phone? A voicemail or a receptionist or security guard or what? Or maybe the most inexperienced intern in the office. Yeah. And sometimes they would say, well, we don't, we don't make mistakes. We're, we're the newspaper, you know? Yeah. And once, once you had that initial communication that was bad, you, you couldn't recover from it. Then they went right. to, let's, let's sue them. Then it escalates, yeah. But if you immediately are empathetic, and start to listen, what can we do to resolve this? What can we do yeah. to make it better? Then people tend to back off. Especially if you can train the frontline staff, like you said, the junior people. But most junior people say, well, I'm just going by the rules. It's not my issue, which then pisses off that person. Yeah, and so what they discovered was that they needed to create processes within these organizations to address how we handle phone calls and how we get yeah these important phone calls to the editor or to the news director. Yeah. And save on those legal bills. <laughs> and time and yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Dennis, we're running kind of short on time. Speaking of that, uh, I, I did have one other item that I was reminded about when we, when you were talking to Samantha mm -hmm. about reflecting back we were giving a word to describe what makes an exceptional presentation or speech. And Samantha mentioned humor. And yeah. that led us to have the kind of conversation you were talking about, because I agreed that humor is really important, but that it has to be used very carefully because it can yeah. backfire. And then we had some conversations, examples yeah. about that. What, how do you handle humor in a presentation? I think humor You've got to be careful. There's three kinds of humor that I see. One is a silly joke. You know, what, what did the little sprinkler say to the big sprinkler? You know, that kind of thing, which is kind of funny. And you can use the canned jokes, but I feel that that's cheating because it's not really your joke and it's, it's not situational. It's just something that you pull out because you don't have anything else. Two is humor that is off color. So if you look at stand-up comedians, they will make jokes that, you know, like a Dave Chappelle that is racist or sexist or, to put it kindly, I guess, addresses issues that people are uncomfortable with as a society. So from, in a business setting, those are dangerous things to try to be humorous about. Just because of a microphone, you have a bunch of people, doesn't mean you're Dave Chappelle, right? 
And then the third kind of humor, which is executive humor, is because when a CEO tells a joke, of like a real CEO, it's usually self-deprecating. You guys know what that means? To have self-deprecating humor, that class of humor? So I would say, for example, like we're here and like, let's say this is a professional meeting and I was wearing, you know, a nice shirt. Sometimes just for fun, I would say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm business on top and party in the bottom. I'd show like, I'd show my shorts here, right? I have a nice shirt and show some shorts here or something where you're showing that you're human in a particular way. And people really empathize with that. And so self-deprecating humor <clears throat> is when you help you, you lower yourself, not in a demeaning way, but in a way where people feel like they can relate to you. For example, do you guys remember Cambridge Analytica and that whole Mark Zuckerberg before Congress and Senator rerun ads and all that? You remember when that was like a big thing on TV? So CNN invited me to fly down to Atlanta and be on their, on their studios. Sorry, let me just turn this thing off. And I was live in front of three and a half million people being interviewed in the studio about Facebook and whether it should be regulated and that kind of, I got famous on that just for a moment. Right. And what I'll do is I'll take that clip and I'll play it in front of audiences. And the first 10 minutes, I'm like this or not 10 minutes or 10 seconds. I'm like this. Cause I didn't realize the camera was on me when they were introducing me. I was like looking at the screen on the side and like, dang, I'm on TV. Right. And then I look like an idiot and friends of mine, they were calling me like, Dennis, dude, I was like boarding a flight and I saw you on CNN on the TV thing, but you look like you were high or something. What was going on? Are you okay? So that's self-deprecating because you're showing yourself in a way where you're not saying like, oh, I'm a drunk and I'm, you know, I have, I have three DUIs. Or like, you're not, I don't. I'm just saying like, you know, if there was something I had embarrassing, I'm not saying that, right? I'm doing something that it's, it's, it's self-deprecating humor because I'm showing something that reveals me in a human way, like in a foible or a vulnerable way without saying like, oh yeah, I beat my wife or something like that, right? So, you know, you see what I mean with the difference? So executive humor is when you say something that, that allows the audience to identify with you. It's the exact opposite of boasting. And so people like that because then they, they, it's really just empathy. And that's what causes people to clap is the, is the empathy that comes from the self-deprecating humor. You see what I mean? Part of it might be also showing humility that you're humble about whatever your station in life is. Yeah. That's a tough balance. That's a lot of nuance. I bet you Sheridan's good at that. I get the sense she naturally has that skill. Yeah, I sense that too. Yeah, she's shaking her head. She has it's to convince. Just kind of making it so that people can relate to you because then they're kind of willing to listen to whatever you have to say at that point. Yeah. Your body language radiates that. All I did before you even spoke, I could just tell that from your body language. Well, Dennis, this has been terrific. I so appreciate, uh, we appreciate you taking the time to speak with the students who are here live, as well as many more who will watch the recording after they finish work tonight. And I think we've learned a lot about the nature of what it takes to inform and persuade people. So let's- And you guys are Dennis, lucky to have Jeremy. <clears throat> let's give Dennis you. a hand, okay? I wish we were together in person, but we'll just have to wait until this Corona thing dies down, huh? <laughs>